All right. Turn with me to Psalm 34. We continue our study through this book. Some of you may have noticed this week, Kathy started posting um, these psalms, sermons, teachings uh, on our... And, and maybe some of you didn't know this, but we do have a YouTube channel. Do they call it a channel? We have a YouTube presence. And Kathy's posting... Um, the Psalms teachings on the Calvary Chapel of Lima YouTube channel. Did I say that right? Okay. Um, and we were trying to figure out, because she was looking in the archives, when did we start this book anyway? So she, so she could find it by date, sort by date. And, and we figured that it was when? January 12th. Sherry's scaring me. She's got it wrote down in her notebook. <laughs> wow. Chip. Dude. I'm telling you. <laughs> I better watch what I... Uh, that's exactly right. Could, Chip, could you lift that notebook maybe? <laughs> We're in Psalm 34. We made it to about verse 10, I think. Is that right? Does that sound right? Okay. Well, let's read through it then, the first nine verses, um, just by way of introduction and um, set the context for today. Notice the superscription, a psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. And you remember that that was just a title. Abimelech was a title the Philistine kings, much like Pharaoh was of the Egyptian kings. And if you're interested in reading about the context of the events that inspired this psalm, then you can read 1 Samuel chapters 21 and 22. And that'll give you the background uh, for this. So David says that, verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. The takeaway there is what? What does all times encompass? Good and not so good. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Do you understand that that takes a conscious effort on your part? How many, just a quick unscientific survey, how many of you Every day of your life, every waking moment, feel like praising the Lord. Anybody want to dare to put their hand up? Okay. <laughs> you have some off days, don't you? You have some days where you're more focused on your issues and your circumstances than you are praising the Lord. And yet David says that he wants to be at a place where he's praising the Lord continually. So he will always have a spirit of praise. That's the point. My soul, verse 2 shall make its boast in the Lord. I think I pointed out last week when you do your word studies, and please do them, anything that, that jumps out at you in the text when you're studying, do your word studies and find out what is the root of that. And what you're going to find out here, this word boast, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord, it's the same root word for praise. Same root word for praise. So boasting, when we think of boasting, we think that we're boasting about ourselves, right? But David says, no, my boasts, when I boast, it'll be about God. I will boast about him. I will praise him. The reason, he says, is because the humble shall hear it and rejoice. So that's your testimony, right? We all have a testimony. We know that, right? You know that the world is always watching you? Always watching you. Whether you understand it or not, they're, they're glancing and they're trying to evaluate, okay, does this person's walk match their talk? Yeah. Does it match? Because we got all kinds of sayings in the culture, don't we? Talk's cheap. Words are a dime a dozen. I see you talk the talk. Let me see you walk the walk. You get all these things. And what it's really saying is, I hear what you're saying, but your actions are speaking louder than your words. And I'll put a lot of stock in what you're saying if your life doesn't match up. And I think that's fair, don't you? We say that we belong to the Lord, 
there we are a Christ follower, that we are a disciple of, of the Lord Jesus, then our life should look like something. And it should not look like the world. So now he calls on all of the folks with him. And you'll recall, I didn't point this out. Uh, I did last week. But the context is that David is in the caves of Adullam. You remember? In the wilderness, he's hiding from Saul. And he has all these disgruntled Israelis join him. And so they're all in this cave. So he's saying this, the first couple of verses, he's singing this song. And then verse 3, it's as if he looks at the rest of his companions there in the cave and he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. So join me in this, he's saying. And let us exalt his name together. Guys, could you imagine what 400 men singing praises to God in a cave would sound like? Wow. That'd be pretty awe-inspiring, wouldn't it? I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. And again, it's helpful to remember the context. David is running and hiding from Saul. He's just even gone into the land of the Philistines to seek refuge, but he had to play like he was crazy in order to be protected from being murdered or executed because he was their enemy, right? And yet he says here, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Here's the takeaway from that. Failure is not permanent. Failure is not permanent. Who among us has not stumbled and fallen at some point in our walk? And then we think, how can God ever forgive me for this? Here's the good news. He does. As we confess and repent, God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, encourages us and strengthens us for the trial and helps us then to walk by faith. Remember, failures are not permanent. Second, God's for you, not against you. God, although we do sometimes, God never kicks us when we're down. God always has a helping hand to pick us back up to dust us off, to get us back on our way. So they look to him, he says in verse 5, they, being all these people who boast in the Lord, who humble themselves before the Lord, who exalt his name together, who seek him and trust him, they looked to him and were radiant. Yeah, when you're walking in the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, your face is going to show it. You can't help but have that testimony. When you're trusting in God day by day, when you're walking in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, your face is going to show it. You're going to have that joy. You won't have that, that look. Someone once said, I would be a Christian if it weren't for the Christians I knew. Yikes. And that's, yes, amen. <laughs> I, think it was, I think it was Chuck Swindoll that said, um, we need to get past the point of reflecting our Christian life where it looks like our face was baptized in lemon juice. <laughs> do, do you know any believers like that? I mean, that's sad. That's a sad testimony. It shouldn't be that way. It should not be that way. Believers of all people should have joy. We know what our eternal home is. We have the fellowship of the Spirit, and we have one another we of all people should be exhibiting hope and joy and peace and confidence. So these people then who exhibit these characteristics, David says in verse 5, they looked to him and were radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed, so their countenance will not fall even in trying times. This poor man, now David talks about himself, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. What confidence we can have in the Lord. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Now, again, you may check the grammar here. If you have a good Hebrew uh, linear text, you can check that if you have those tools. If not, use them online. There's all kinds of online tools for Bible study today. Some scholars believe that this word here for angel 
is plural, meaning angels. If it is singular, then it's likely referring to Michael, the archangel. So the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. God protects his people is the point and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So experience him. You understand that this relationship that we have is meant to be experienced. Here's where Christianity takes a, a, a wrong turn and gets off on a dusty trail and ends up in the wilderness at this place right here. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. We get in trouble when we start thinking or we start advocating or we become people who think that Christianity is all about just rote learning and just observing the rules and the regulations and guarding against ever crossing the line. When we get to that mentality, we've missed the essence of what faith in Christ really is all about. The Bible says that the love of Christ will constrain me. See, when we focus more on just obeying the rules and the regulations, we're not in a love relationship. We're in a relationship where we're just trying to stay between the lines so we don't get whacked. <laughs> now, I know some fellowships. I've been there. When I first got saved, I was in a wonderful fellowship. God moved me to another. And one of the things that bothered me from the day that I started attending the fellowship to the day I left was that they had a list on the wall of do's and don'ts. Yeah, they did. And I always looked at that. It was a curiosity at first, and I thought, how odd. Does that mean I have to do those and not do these in order to be a member in good standing? I thought everyone who named the name of Christ by faith was a member of the kingdom. I didn't know you, there were things that you had to do or not do in order to be in right standing. And then I realized, oh, this is about just following the rules and staying between the lines and everything will be good. We left that place. <laughs> As God gave me understanding, it's like, no, no, that's not a love relationship. Now I know that sounds, in our sex-saturated culture, it sounds odd. But let me say this with all sincerity. Jesus Christ wants to have a love relationship with you. Have you considered that? Jesus wants to have a love relationship with you. He isn't going to whack you if you stray outside the lines that someone else has established. The love of Christ will constrain you. The Holy Spirit will set the parameters. You just obey him and be led by the power of the Spirit, and you're going to be fine. You don't need to worry about all these other things that man tries to add to your load. You know, that's nothing more than modern-day Phariseeism. That's what the Pharisees did to the Jewish people. They added on all these rules and regulations. That, and, and as we read back through them, and I don't have time this morning in the context of this teaching to talk about all those things. Well, okay, I'll mention a couple. <laughs> One was if you had false teeth, you couldn't put them in because then on the Sabbath, that would be carrying a burden. I know, right? You were not allowed to spit on the Sabbath. Because if you did, you would run the risk that your spittle would roll and create a furrow, and that would be work. Yeah. Now, I could go on and on and on, but you get the idea. It's pure silliness. But churches today try to put that on their people, and it's, it's maddening to me. It drives me crazy along with a whole bunch of other things that <laughs> goes on in the name of Christ today. So this poor man cried out, verse 6, And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues him. 
Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So experience him. It's a love relationship. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. Fear there is a reverential fear. A fear of awe, a fear of worship. For those who fear him, there is no want. So in other words, for those who honor him, for those who reverence him, for those who worship him, and those are all characteristics that describe whom? Born-again believers. So born-again believers, for those who are living in obedience to the Lord, who are worshiping him, who are honoring him, there is no want. There is no want. God himself will be everything that we need. That's the point. So that brings us then to verse 10, and I think that's about where we left off last week. Notice that it says the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. The idea here, brothers and sisters, is that those who are strong and powerful tend to rely on their own abilities to get by in life. Those who have places of prominence or power or wealth seem to rely on that instead of relying on God. Now, in contrasting that and what we've already read and what we're going to read now is that those who seek God, who look to Him, who cry out to Him for their deliverance, who recognize God's holiness by their worship of Him, will lack no good thing. And of course, what needs to be said, unfortunately, in our culture today, when we say that folks will lack no good thing, it's good as God defines it. Because I've heard so much nonsense out there, all related to this idea that well, all I have to do is say this or name this or claim this and God is obligated to give it to me. Listen, brothers and sisters, God is not obligated to you for anything. If God is required to give to you because you say the word, who's sovereign here in this relationship? If there is some kind of special formula that you just utter because, you know, your words have power, you know, you send them out. And we're all little gods, right? So we send the word out and it has power to unleash whatever we... Oh, my goodness. Do you know the background, the history of that? You know what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about the modern prosperity word faith. And I'll say it. Heresies, false teachings. That all comes from the mind science cults. Do you understand that? Christian science... It all goes back to Phineas Quimby and the New England Theosophists and, and all of the mind science, from where Christian science came from. You know, there are people that deny reality. They're almost, it's almost like a, a little mixture of Hinduism blended in there because they deny, if you deny sickness, don't utter the word, don't ever claim that I'm sick. You can be sicker than a dog, can hardly move. And I'm not going to say it because then I will be, you know, and wait a minute, you already are. What are you talking about? <laughs> You're not just because you admit it. There are people that take it to the extreme that they won't even take their sick children to the hospital. Oh, I just got to have faith that God will heal them. Yeah, and then they die. I can't fathom that kind of teaching. But there are places that teach that. I remember someone telling me many, many years ago, that a church that they were attending. Their father got sick and, and died. And the church pastor, staff told them, well, the reason that your father died is because you didn't have enough faith for him to be healed. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? I can't. I, I, I personally, I think that's godlessness. So he says here that the young lions, those who try to do things their own way, they just kind of reject God. But those, David says, who cry out, who seek, who recognize God's holiness, they'll not lack any good thing. 
verse 11. And this begins really the, the sermon part of this psalm. You remember that in the introduction last week, I told you that Psalm 34 is basically broken down in between a song and a sermon. The first 10 verses are the song, and the last 11 through 22 are the sermon. And you can see that marked here. He says, come you children, listen to me. Now, I, I find that humorous knowing the context because David's a young man. He's maybe 30, but he's in a cave with 400 Israeli soldiers who have left Saul's army, and most of them are old, grizzled veterans of war and combat. And he's saying, listen to me, children. I, I just find that humorous. It's like, wow, David, you, you, you have a lot of courage in the face of these guys. Come, you children, listen to me. And I will teach you the fear of the Lord. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Really? I will teach you the fear of the Lord, David says. What do you have to be in order to teach somebody else something? You have to be experienced in that thing you're teaching, right? David knows what he's talking about here. He's in essence saying, here's what I have learned in my relationship with God. And you need to understand this. Now, I personally believe because of the context, remember that this is the foundation. This is the beginning of the greatest army that Israel ever had. They served under King David, and they rose to staggering heights and prominence and power. But this is the beginning. They're all hiding in a cave. And so David is saying, here's what life in the kingdom that God is establishing through me, because David already knew he had been anointed to be Saul's successor, right? So he's saying, here is what the kingdom is going to look like as God is going to establish it. You need to understand something, because he was looking out and he was seeing within the personalities and some of the actions and behaviors of these men things that could not continue. And so he was issuing some instructions. And so he says, listen to me, Listen to me and learn what it means to worship God. And then he looks at this ragtag bunch of men frustrated with Saul, frustrated with the state of Israel, forced to leave, at least at this point, their wives and their children, their family, their homes, forced to flee and live in a desert. And David says, verse 12, Who is the man who desires life? and loves length of days that he may see good. Well, that is really setting the table very well, don't you think? All these men have left everything. They're hiding in this cave, and David says, okay, is there anyone here who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? I imagine every hand in the cave shot up. Yeah, that's me. You just described me. That's what I want. So then he lowers the boom. That was a trap, or maybe not a trap. That's too, that doesn't give the right picture. That was an introductory comment to elicit a positive response. How's that? That sounds better, right? We're baiting the trap. It's still, it's coming to mind. So that's what it was. David knew what he was doing. And he's saying, okay, I'm going to set this up so every one of you are going to agree. Yes, that's what we want. Well, here's the deal. Because he knew if he just launched into this, some guys are going to say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just like we do today, we get some pushback when we say, well, do you want to follow Jesus? Are you a Christ follower? Are you a disciple of the Lord? Well, then that looks like something. But by the way, it looks like something exactly opposite from your nature. It's going to look like something exactly the opposite of what you want to do in your own flesh. You all understand when you follow Jesus, you have to die to self. Do you understand that you need to slay the flesh daily? Well, what do I mean when I say that? It means when your desires start welling up and you want to behave or act or do or say in a certain way and the Holy Spirit gives you a check, you need to obey the check. That's killing the flesh day by day. Paul talked about that, didn't he, in, in Romans 7 and 8. And the summation of it all and this is Paul, and that gives me hope. Paul said, the very thing that I want to do, 
I don't do. And the very thing that I don't want to do, that's the thing I do. God, who will deliver me from this? And then he says what? Praise be that the Lord Jesus Christ is able and has delivered me. Our power is in Christ. But day by day, it's called sanctification. We must slay the flesh. Now, Kathy and I had a conversation over dinner last night. And, uh, you know, Cracker Barrel's got some good ribs. I didn't know that until last night. We were sitting there and, well, you, you all know, Cracker Barrel's my favorite restaurant because I'm a gray hair and I fit in. But <laughs> I didn't know they had ribs. And so, man, these things were good. There's the St. Louis style. I prefer the Kansas City style, but St. Louis style was good. So I was, you know, we were, we were chatting it up and, and I don't know why this came to mind. Oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. So we decided we were going to go do something else and why we were going to go do that, not at a later date. And, and so while we do this, we're going to go here and do this. And then that reminded us of an incident at that place. You following me? It's a daisy chain. <laughs> no, Mike, you've completely confused me. <laughs> well, here's the point. We relived the situation there when I acted like a jerk. And my wife, bless her heart, says, no, you, you didn't act like a jerk. And I said, you're so sweet. But yes, I was. Well, I don't know if I can stay here, Mike, if you can act like a jerk. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll behave and move on. But the point was, I had an opportunity to slay the flesh, and the flesh got the better of me. Day by day, you'll be faced with choices. Either slay the flesh or let the flesh win. Now, for me, it's more my attitude. God is strengthening me more and more to control my mouth. Because believe me, you all think, what? There is, there is a very short time span between what you think and what comes out. So I don't know about that, Mike, but no, believe me, I'll say half the stuff I want to say. But now the battle is my attitude. And some of you may fight that battle, too, with your attitude. But that's the point here, brothers and sisters. So notice what he says. If you want to live long days, if you love lengths of days, if you want to have a long life, if you want it to be good, he says. And again, good as God describes it, right? If you want to live long life, if you want to see your circumstances turn around, and of course everyone does, right? Every one of us for sure. He says, okay, here's what it takes. Verse 13. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Now, let's break all that down because he just said a mouthful. If you want to live long life and see your circumstances turn around, guard your tongue. Now, I'm seeing some of you gulp hard. It's such a simple thing, isn't it? Guard your tongue. And yet, do you understand? James said it this way, the tongue is such a small thing, but it's like the rudder of a ship. That little thing right there can guide your life. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? James says the tongue is a fire. How's that? <laughs> it's a fire. Your tongue can cause destruction. How many of you have ever been verbally abused? Don't raise your hands. And I hate to, I'm not trying to have you relive things. You know it's true because you've been the recipient of an evil tongue. 
How many of you have verbally abused other people? Yikes. Keep your tongue from evil. Now, that's part of the slaying the flesh day by day, sanctification that Paul talks about. Taking charge and command of that little bitty member of your body. That's why we're, taught, we're told so many times in the New Testament in the body life, one of the most dangerous things that can go on is to allow what? Gossip. Gossip. Praise God, that doesn't go on here. You all have been trained to do this. If somebody comes to you with a tale about someone else, first thing comes out of your mouth is what? Have you talked to that person about this yet? And if the answer is no, what do you say? Then I don't want to hear it. Don't be running to, and that includes me as the pastor, don't be running to me with a tale about someone, and y'all don't, thinking, well, I'm going to tell you and then you can do something about it. No, it happened to you, you do something about it. Who made me the sheriff? Well, that's your job. Don't tell me what my job is. I know what my job is. It isn't to clean up your messes. Well, so tell us what you really think, Mike. Well, when have I never? <laughs> now, if it's something that requires some insight or some advice or some counsel, I'd be happy to give you that, but... I'm not responsible to clean up your messes. That's part of having big boy and big girl pants on. Living life. It's part of life, right? Guarding your tongue, though. Here's what I want you to understand. In order to guard your tongue, you need to guard your mind. You need to guard your mind. Why? Well, because guarding your mind guards your heart because what comes out of your mouth took up residence in your heart and in your mind long before it came out. Right? Most things don't come out just spur of the moment. Most hateful, evil Verbal abuse comes out because it's been percolating. It starts here. How many of you tell yourself stories about situations? And you've got the whole situation mapped out. You know exactly how things went down. You know exactly. And if you ever get the chance, this is what I'm going to say in this situation. How many of you do that? You map it all out. <laughs> I see a lot of shaking heads. Yeah, because you know it's true. I counsel couples against this. When they're having problems, I say, now listen, don't play the lawyer. And they look at me, what are you talking about? Well, you know, your spouse is saying something, but you're not really listening to what your spouse is saying. What you're doing is you're already formulating your rebuttal while they're still talking. You're already deciding what it is you're going to say. And as soon as they shut up or take a breath... You're leaping in there, whoop, here, and you lay it out. It's like, don't do that. Don't do that. And so in order, verse 13, to keep your tongue from evil, you need to start with your mind. Don't let that stuff take up residence in your mind because if you do, it's going to make that very short journey from your mind to your heart. And the Bible says that when that takes a, a hold of your heart, it's called a root of bitterness, by the way, when that grows in your heart, you're in serious spiritual trouble. And now you need, you need an intervention more than the person that you're upset with because you've allowed this to grab a hold of your heart and it becomes a source of bitterness and it will generate an evil tongue. So David's laying all this out to his guys and he's saying, listen, here's what it's gonna look like in the kingdom. You're gonna to have to control your tongue and that starts with controlling your mind and your heart. Things are going to be different when God establishes the kingdom under my leadership. Isn't that a remarkable picture? I think it's a picture for the church. 
Why do I think it's a picture for the church? Because so many people give this no thought whatsoever. They just step out of their lives in the world and they step into the church service or the church meeting or whenever we gather together and they don't really understand you cannot have the mindset of the world and be a part of God's kingdom and his family because what will happen is you'll cause problems. If you think the same way you think in the world and you come into the fellowship among the sheep, you're going to act like a wolf because that's what the world teaches you. Do you understand we have a different mindset, a different marching order when we come into the body of Christ? We do. And so Paul is telling us that. He's saying, keep your tongue from evil. Guard your mind and your heart. He says, and your lips from speaking deceit. Now, I'm not going to labor this too much more. I think you get the point. But when he says... Keep your lips from speaking deceit. What does deceit mean? Well, I get the picture of like a magician. It's, it's like a sleight of hand. How many of you have ever seen some of those uh, programs on, on cable where the, the street music, uh, magicians, and they're doing the shell game, and, and then you've got to pick where the, the ball or the cup, you know what I'm talking about, right? Well, they're pretty good at that. How many of you get where the ball's at all the time? Most times you don't. Well, that's because sleight of hand, and they deceive you. Well, how does that work with the mouth, and how does that tie in to the speaking evil of the tongue? Well, here's part of our human nature, and we all have it, but we have to fight it. We have to combat it. It's part of the sanctification process. When we're speaking out of turn or out of line, and we really should not be speaking in this context because it's borderline gossip, in almost every instance, we're not going to give a balanced, objective presentation of the details. We are going to kind of paint it or spin it in a way where we look favorable, right? Well, I've been the truth too much. I mean, it, it, those, some of those things happened, and this is just my interpretation of them, but, but I didn't call that out. Be very careful about what you say and how you say it and make sure that what you say is accurate and not just from your perspective after it's been through the spin machine but make sure that it's accurate to what actually happened don't speak deceit because that really is deceit if you're trying to get someone to accept a version of a situation the way you want them to accept it that's manipulation folks See, we don't need to rely on all that. Just give the details. Just give the facts. Because guess what? Who's your defender and shield anyway? Who's guarding your reputation? Do you need to stay up late at night and guard your reputation? No. Who does? God. Now, I know that by experience, and some of you in here <laughs> know that too. We had a wacko not long ago that got upset with, with me and started posting all kinds of inaccurate and deceitful things on Facebook. Now, you haven't been in the ministry too long if you haven't been attacked yet, right? Because it's not a matter of if, but when. It's going to happen. You stand week by week before God's people and you say, thus saith the Lord, sooner or later, somebody's going to get their nose all bent out of shape. <laughs> they're going to take exception with something and then they're going to just start running their mouth. Well, one of the things that I've learned over the years is I don't have to defend myself, and I don't. I don't, when those things come, I say nothing. I say nothing. I don't say a word. You know why? Because I know God's going to take care of it. Now, I know that takes a lot, sometimes through clenched teeth, right? Because your flesh is crying out, Jump in there. You know what you want to say. Don't do it. You're just legitimizing that when you do it. Just let God handle it. Just let God handle it. And so, depart from evil then, verse 14. Notice this. This is all connected here, folks. Depart from evil, so remove yourself from evil contexts, from evil circumstances, from evil people if necessary. 
depart from evil and do good. And then notice here, seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. Depart from evil, focus on doing good. And then David says, seek and pursue. Make an effort to achieve those things. Run hard after peace. Make it a top priority. Jesus said the same thing to us, didn't he, in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now, I'm not talking about some kind of pacifism and those kinds. That's a misguided theology to begin with. But what I'm talking about is that as far, and the, this is Paul again, I love quoting Paul, but as far as it is within your ability and your power, I will be at peace with all people. Now, what, is it, what does it mean? It simply means this. Paul says, it takes two to tango, and I refuse to partner up with that. I'm not going to keep stirring the pot. I'm just going to step back out of it. So that's what he's saying. So seek peace and pursue it. And know that in this pursuit of God, he is pleased. That's verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. That pleases God when you are a peace seeker. When you seek to be all that God wants you to be, when you remove yourself from evil situations and circumstances, that is very pleasing to God. He will show you favor when you pursue righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for peace, for they shall be what? Satisfied. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing on the face of the earth, and there never will be, that satisfies like God. Nothing. His ears, his eyes are open to their cry. When you're on the path of righteousness, God is quick to hear and respond. Now, the same is not true of those who practice evil. Note verse 16. The face of the Lord is against evildoers. You know, that's something that just baffles me today, is that we have people that, that claim Christ. And you know, we live in a nation where just because uh, someone is born here, not so much today as it used to be, but still to a large degree, many people identify as Christian when they fill out surveys or forms or whatever and it says religion or faith, they put Protestant or Christian or whatever. And they're no more Christian than this bottle of water right here. I think the latest Pew Research data says that about 75% of Americans identify as Christian. Now, brother and sister, you know that can't be true. Well, what do you mean, Mike? Why can't that be true? Would we be seeing the things in, the, in America today that we're seeing if 75% of the citizens were born again, blood-bought, redeemed, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit Christians? Come on. There's no way. America really would be a land that people would want to come to. But that's just not the case. How many... I don't know. If I was to wager a, an opinion, I would say maybe, maybe 20% of America, 20% of Americans are actually born-again believers. But God says that his face is against, he is opposed to evildoers, those who believe that they can prosper in the midst of their wickedness. God has a message for those people. Repent or be judged and eternally separated from his goodness. Because notice what it says. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Do you understand that's talking about judgment? We talked about this in Men's Discipleship Thursday. You cannot present the gospel without talking about judgment. Now, I know that's not a popular thing today. Many, many, and it grieves my heart when I see this, and I see it way too often. People think that presenting the gospel is trying to convince somebody to try Jesus so that they can experience all the good things Jesus wants to do for them in their life. 
Well, here's what I do know. Jesus said foxes have dens and holes and places to sleep, but I don't. Jesus said, I came to serve and to suffer. Jesus didn't talk about an easy life. Jesus said, count the cost of following me because it is going to cost you. The exact opposite of what we see in far too many places today. People think that the gospel is something that is going to give us the warm fuzzies. No, the real gospel when it's presented to a lost person will cause conviction of sin. It will cause a brokenness and a mourning over that and they will repent of that. You see, that's what the gospel is meant to do. It's to bring people into repentance so that they might receive forgiveness and the mercy of God. It's not try Jesus on like anything else and see if he makes your life better. I got news for you. Jesus is not going to make your life better by just coming to church or being baptized or putting money in the offering box or any of those other religious things that people think they can do to appease God. That's not how it works. The gospel is vastly different than that. So God is against evildoers. Judgment faces them. That's what it means to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Notice verses 17 and 18. The righteous cry and the Lord hears. Is that comforting to you? It should be. That should be very comforting to you. The righteous cry and the Lord hears. And when I was chewing on these texts, I couldn't help but think about Pastor Saeed Abedini. How many of you have been praying for him for these many, many years? You know, he is still locked up in Iran in one of the worst prisons there. And you know what he is guilty of? Being a Christian. Being a Christian. Pastor Abedini, in fact, from everything that I'm reading, is now being physically abused. He's now being beaten by other Muslim prisoners. I don't know if, if the prison guards are involved in this not, but he is being beaten severely now without provocation. And what he's being told is, all you need to do is recant Christ. Just recant Christ and we'll leave you alone. He refuses. Continue to pray for him his family. And then I think about somebody like Kent Hovan. Are you familiar with Kent Hovan? Kent Hovan has been languishing in prison now for over nine years. And from the things that I've been reading, he's now, and again, I, it's hard for me to grasp that these things are going on in America, but these are the reports that we're receiving. He is now being pretty much tortured He's in a solitary confinement cell with no windows. They've got the air conditioning blasting as cold as it can. He doesn't have any clothes other than his, his undershorts and T-shirt. He sleeps on a metal bed with no blankets. Now, you're probably thinking, that is impossible, Mike. That's in the letter that came from the prison. They redacted much of it, but they left that in. Why? I have no idea. But the question is, how can that happen? How can that happen? You know what he's guilty of? Being a Christian. Friends, we are living in a time and day when our government is anti-Christian. And before you mishear me, that did not start with Mr. Obama. I got news for you. It goes back a long, long way. At least a century. So what does that tell you? We are up to our eyebrows in difficulties today. Be praying for these men. But I thought of them as I was reading this, verse 17, the righteous cry and the Lord hears. You know, that's the only comfort that they have. 
is their relationship with God. That's the only thing they have. They have no comforts like us. He delivers them from all their troubles. You know, that's a supernatural thing. And I could relate this to one other thing, and then we'll move on. But we won't even finish 34 today. All of the Christian martyrs that we see today being murdered at the hands of the Islamic terrorists, not one instance out of all of them. In fact, I saw something today that I, I thought for a moment about printing out and showing it today. But not one of the Christian martyrs are shown in distress. If somebody was threatening to cut my head off, I, I don't know that I could have a calm demeanor. No, I'm just going to confess. I think I'd be a little upset about that. I saw a picture, and again, let me give this caveat. There used to be a saying, <laughs> and people would say it and they'd roll their eyes. It's like, well, I saw it on the Internet, so it must be true. Yeah, okay. Well, the same thing applies to Facebook, right? You all know that about half of the stuff on Facebook is false. You know, many of the... And, and, and I sent these sites to a couple of people already. If you want them, let me know and I'll send them to you. But a lot of the, the news sites on Facebook that look on the surface like they're actual news sites and they talk about all these things that are going on, these conspiracies and all this kind of stuff... They're actually fake news sites. And when you post and repost those things, it makes you look like an idiot. It just does. So you need to get past this point and think, well, it was on Facebook. It must be true. Really? No, you need to take most things on Facebook with a whole tablespoon of salt. I mean, Facebook is set up to present a reality that you want to create, right? Who you are on Facebook, well, most of you, who you are on Facebook doesn't tell the real story, does it? Now, I've seen some people, boy, they get on Facebook and they just let it all hang out. It's like, ooh. They don't hold back nothing. <laughs> I kind of marvel at that, too, but I'll leave that alone. But I wonder about all these martyrs. How in the world do they face that? Well, you know how they face it? It's the Spirit of God. In your time of need, God is going to give you exactly what you need to face whatever it is. How do I know that? I've just given you all kinds of examples. Pastor Abedini, Kent Hoban, all of these folks that are being martyred, murdered. Can you imagine being locked into a cage and set on fire? That breaks my heart. And yet... They're only guilty of being a Christian who refused to recant their faith in Jesus Christ. And we say, that could never happen in America. Oh, my goodness, you better wake up because it's already coming. You know we've had beheadings here in America already? What? Come on, how do you spend your days? I work too, so don't say, well, I work. Well, you've got other hours. What are you doing with your time? Hopefully you're not lounged on the couch being fed that constant drumbeat of propaganda from that thing we call the television. You know that's all that is, right? You're being fed what the elitists want you to know. That's TV. Don't have time for that either. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, verse 18, crushes and saves those who are crushed in spirit. That would be all of those I've just described. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Do you know God controls our destiny, brothers and sisters? Tribulation cannot rob you of your salvation. Do you know that when God saves you, he saves you for eternity? Those whom he calls, the Bible says, Romans chapter 8, all of those whom he calls, you go down through that 
long list of all the things that God does in your life, Romans chapter 8, culminating with about verse 30 or 32, and it says, after all of those things, all those he calls, he glorifies. Do you know what glorifies means? It means he takes you to your eternal home. All of us are going to receive glorified bodies one day. And that's especially good news for folks like me. Age is starting to catch up. And I know Judy's probably, yep, laughing already. Every time I say I'm old, she says, you're not old. Well, I'm getting older. I never thought I'd see the day when I was 59 years old. And I've seen changes. I used to be like this, and I'm like that. I used to have hair. Angie will tell you, she remembers. Thick brown hair. And then I had four daughters. <laughs> I always blame them. The point is this, verse 19, you have an eternal destiny, and it's in God's hands. You know what that means for you? That means you don't have to be on the performance treadmill. So many people think, well, I got to do, I got to go, I got to be, I got to do, and this and that, and all. No, that's going right back and placing yourself under all those rules and regulations. Do you understand that God loves you? And then no matter what you do, he's going to pick you up and dust you off and keep you moving in the right direction. He has your salvation in his hand. Your salvation is not dependent on, well, I got to do, I got to go, I got to be. No. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in the God life, and he will do that. When you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, the things that you do will be pleasing to the Father. But your salvation is not in question. You have a destiny. God will deliver you from all of these present trials. That's verse 19. He keeps 20, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Now that's interesting because the Apostle John in chapter 19 quoted this verse as prophetically as a fulfillment in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. David, speaking of this personally, however, he's marveling at how God has delivered them from all these close calls. You know, Saul has tried to kill him at this point several times and David has escaped every one. Have you ever marveled at the things that God preserves you from? How many of you have had close calls in life and you thought, man, the Lord got me through that one? I'm wondering, and I, this is just my opinion, I don't know, there's no scriptural support for it, but I'm wondering if in any fashion or way, when we're with the Father in heaven, Will we know of all the things that he actually did save us from that we had no clue? Because you all know you escape death daily and don't even know it. <laughs> Not even aware of it. Just living, skipping down the road, happily and merrily, and things are going on all around you that were a threat to your life. And God preserves you. He keeps all your bones. Not one of them is broken. 21. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. Now, here's the destiny of every God-hater. And this includes all the flower power people who... I, I just saw something this week about, um, about this new festival, this new gathering of New Agers. You know, New Agers are some of the most disconnected, naive people on the face of the earth. They worship the earth, in fact. But they're so disconnected from reality, they think that they just live in this reality, in this bubble, nothing can touch them. <laughs> it's pretty scary stuff. But God is saying here that all of these people who we would term as god hater, earth worshipers, the new age of Aquarius, you know that's still with us? It's still with us. I was interviewing a lady the other day, in fact, for the radio show, and she came out of that stuff. She came out of the New Age stuff. 
I call them moonbeams. You may call them something else. But. <laughs> but God says, listen, evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. So all those who attack God's people, their judgment day is coming. Now, we summarize it this way. We've got a saying for that. Maybe we've never given it a thought to what we mean by that. But how many of you have ever said this? What goes around comes around. <laughs> well, that's usually given in the context that, yeah, you'll get yours. And I'll just wait. Because if there's any cosmic justice at all, you're going to pay for that. Well, here's the thing. And we'll see this more next week because we, believe it or not, are out of time. So we're not even going to get to 35 this week. Big surprise, huh? What goes around comes around. Now, next week when we get into Psalm 35, this is one of those imprecatory psalms. And if you read ahead, you'll find out what I'm talking about, about imprecatory psalms. It's like, whoa, David, settle down, man. And you'll find out. Because David says some things, and woo, how does that line up with the New Testament? Well, we'll talk about that. We'll put that in context. But here in this verse, 21, evil shall slay the wicked. Those who hate the righteous will be condemned. Here's what we need to guard against as believers, taking that into our own hands. Taking that into our own hands. You see, who is it that will judge? God. The scripture says, allow room for the patience of the Lord and for his vengeance. Do you know that the Lord may be working in somebody's life to bring them around to faith? And you're asking God, God, strike them dead, man. Or cut them off at the knee. Oh, don't laugh at me. You act like you've never thought that before. <laughs> you know you have. We shouldn't. It's natural, it is, to want to have retribution, and we want it on when? Our time schedule, right? We don't want God to wait. Now, don't you find that ironic? We wanted God to wait when it was us. When we fall into something, we pray, plead for mercy, don't we? And patience. Well, the right thing to do is to be patient and merciful to other people as well. And that's going to be a challenge for some of us more than others. <laughs> but those who hate the righteous will be condemned, so they'll be judged. And by the way, here's just a thought. When we talk about judgment, and this might be something you want to put in your toolkit so that you can share it with people, lost people, family members, when you're sharing the gospel with them, help them to understand that they must make a decision in time and space concerning Jesus Christ? Because I've heard this. Maybe you have too. Well, when I get before the man upstairs, I'm just going to plead my case. And God's love, right? So he'll understand. Oh, dear soul, understand this, that the life you're living right now in time and space, you are in effect passing judgment on yourself. But what are you talking about, Mike? When they stand before God, there's no conversation between them and God. There's no pleading the case. There's no setting him straight. The Bible says that on that day, every, how many is every? All, every, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Help people to understand. They can shake their fist at God in space and time, but they're not going to be shaking their fist at God in eternity. They're going to be bowing the knee. And there will be no words of defense, no words of justification that come out of their mouth. And sadly, those who deny Christ in time and space and bow the knee in eternity, the next words they're going to hear is, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. That's sad, and that should cause us to really be motivated to tell people, listen, when you reject God, you're passing sentence on yourself. 
God's not, it's popular for people to think, well, yeah, God's going to, you know, he's going to have this big IMAX screen and he's just going to run through your whole life and say, now that, yep, that's going to cost, yep, that's going to cost you. Oh, look at that. Oh, man, I'm sorry. No, no, that's not what it is at all. When you stand before God, he'll pass judgment and then you'll be cast into hell. Help people to understand that. You see, living the Christian life is not this yellow brick road experience. We have a mission. We have a purpose. God wants to use us to bring people into the kingdom. Do you understand that? You're no more ready for heaven today than the day you were born, positionally speaking. When we're born again, we are born as sons and daughters. We become joint heirs with Christ. We are, have the riches of heaven opened up to us. Well, if that's the case, why didn't you take me out when you saved me? Well, there's a reason. And what is that? So that we might proclaim his goodness and the excellencies of Jesus. We're, we're, we're to be evangelists. God has other people that he wants to save. He wants to use us to save them. That's why he left us. It's real easy. And so if he left us to be evangelists, then we need to know what our message is, right? Let's get the message right. Somebody's eternal destiny is dependent on that. Let's get the message right. And that's what verse 22 talks about in closing. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. In contrast to 21, those who are judged, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Hallelujah. That's a good note to end that psalm on. Those who take refuge in him will not be condemned. Paul said it this way, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God doesn't condemn you. If you feel condemned, that's not him. That would be our enemy. God is wanting to encourage you today. Remember, brothers and sisters, that God is for you. He isn't against you. And take that out and talk to people today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Father, for encouraging us today, for reminding us of what a tremendous blessing we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would continue to encourage us, give us courage and boldness to share the gospel with people. They're all around us. And we work with them. Some are our family members. Time is drawing near. It's growing short. We're reminded that your word tells us, work while it is daylight, for the night is approaching when no work will be done. Father, help us to bear that in mind always. And Lord, as we live our life day by day, help us to do so with a tremendous amount of joy. We, above all people, should have joy, thanksgiving, gladness, and it should show on our faces, in our language, by our lives. Help us to do that, Lord. We thank you, Father, for what you're doing in this body of believers. We pray that you would continue to provide for us and cause us to persevere. We want to be a lighthouse. We want to be a shelter from the storm that is living in these days. Help us to be that, to have a welcoming hand, Lord, for all those that you send this way. We love you, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.